Hey guys, welcome back to a new video by Biology Results Trend. So today we are going to go through this Cambridge IGCSC Biology Paper 6 Alternative to Practical, the 0610 Paper 6 Variant 2. So this is the February March 2025 paper. So I want to shout out to uh, Hiba Coral. I've linked um, his her YouTube channel here and for sending me this paper uh, in the YouTube comment section for the paper 4. So I'm so glad that I'm able to do this paper and to create this video for you as soon as possible. And of course, this paper will be linked to the comment section below and also the Google Drive. All right, let's get this started. Question one, Benedict's solution is used for tests for reducing sugars. So glucose is a reducing sugar. A student estimated the concentration of glucose in a solution. So the student uses this method on the label of the six test tubes. 0.0%, uh, 0.5%, 1.0%, 1.5%, 2.0%, and U. So for part A1, so you have to complete table 1 point by writing in the volumes of 2% glucose solution and distilled water to make 4 cm cube of a 1.5% glucose solution. So I'm sure that you have to be careful that this kind of questions can suddenly appear in part of the steps. So please make sure to do this question. Okay, I... I think there are some people who will miss out this question after they see like, hey, this is, looks kind of part of this uh, steps instead. So looking at this, uh, zero for volume of 2% at 0.0% percentage of glucose, as you go uh, higher, it becomes increased, while the volume of water will decrease. So this will be 3 cm cube, and this will be 1 cm cube. All right, and the rest of it, I guess you will read. So uh, just feel free to read through all of these and you can see that uh, some good um, keywords here, okay? And they have already given you, this is the IV for the percentage concentration of glucose. And also what are you going to measure the DV, which is to record the color of the liquid in the test tube. So this will be the DV. So let's see uh, much more closer to this. So they show you the different colors that have changed. And of course, the very first question they will ask you to prepare a table and record the results. So this is the sample table on how you're going to show. So just record all the data inside. Uh, I know that the next question will talk about you, but for now, just put you there because we do not know what is the concentration. And you just create this table, make sure that this is the IV. Usually the left-hand side is the IV and the right-hand side is the DV. Okay, so generally this is how a sample table should look like. Okay, but again, uh, as long as all your data are inside, well recorded, correct uh, labeling, correct headings, you're fine. Okay, then the marks is yours. Okay, for part three, use figure 1.1 to estimate the percentage concentration of glucose in the unknown glucose solution of U. Okay, so they know, they tell you that U appears an orange to yellow color meaning it fits somewhere between this point, between 1.0 to 1.5%. So technically, your answer can be best between 1.0 uh, to 1.5%. The more safer choice would be in the middle of 1.2 or to 1.3, that would be a better option, okay? Because yellow and orange is found between yellow and orange, so that's why the concentration will be just within that range, okay? I hope that makes sense. Part four, state two variables that were kept constant in this investigation. So obviously we are actually recording the uh, concentration of glucose and etc. So what we have to make sure, because we have used a uh, Benedict solution, right? We have to ensure that the same volume of the Benedict solution is first added. And secondly, you, that you also know that Benedict solution for this entire reducing sugar test, you have to heat up to a certain point. So make sure that all of your test tubes when you're heating it is at the same temperature and not anything different than that. Okay, so that is the cause the duration of heating and also the temperature of heating has to be constant. So I've uh, one more thing that you can add could be also the temperature. Okay, so this is also correct if you have added this. Okay, part five. Identify the possible source of error present in steps two and three and state the effect of this error on the results of this investigation. So let's look back at step two. So step two, they told you that 
Use a syringe to put the volumes of 2% glucose solution shown in table 1.1 into the test tube label 0.5% and so on. And you use the same syringe to put 4 cm3 of the unknown glucose solution U to the test tube label U. So obviously the key mistake here is using the same syringe again. Because what you're actually supposed to do, you're supposed to rinse that syringe, that syringe before you use the next one. So using the same syringe without rinsing it between users. And what is the effect? When you added an unknown, let's say an unknown concentration, right? What happens that you do not know whether the concentration is higher than usual or lower than usual. So let's say if it's higher, for example, then it is actually higher than the actual concentration that you were supposed to predict because you do not know what it is. So that's why you have to rinse it so that it doesn't create an, a different effect on the result that or you're predicting that this concentration would be something else. Okay, so that is something that um, the source of error is present in this step two and three. Okay, so for part B, eggs contain a protein called as albumin. So albumin will turn from cloudy, cloudy to clear. So this is, shows you the positive test here. Okay, and then when it is digested by pepsin, a protease enzyme. So plan the investigation to determine the effect of pH on the digestion of albumin by proteases. So, so I'm sure you have familiar with some of my paper 6 videos is that I use the I don't care so run away method so the IDC SRA method okay so first first of all whenever I see this question I want to identify what is the IV what is the DV first so in the question they've already tell you what is the IV the IV is the effect of pH so meaning we are going to use a different kinds of pH when we are testing for this and how are we going to test in that scenario and what is the DV? We know that the DV, the end goal is to digest the albumin by the protease enzyme. But that isn't the actual because dependent variable is something that you will measure. So when you measure, you have to use time. So you use the time taken for the albumin to turn clear, you know, from cloudy to clear. That is the positive test. So that is what we want to, to measure. So remember, the dependent variable, it can give you a clue about digestion. But in order to compare which digestion is faster than another, we have to use time to compare. That's why I've put that time taken for albumin to turn clear using a stopwatch. You can add this so that it creates a little bit more uh, coherence in your understanding of what equipments to use. So again, for the IV, like what I mentioned, five different test tubes, you can give pH 2, 4, 6, 7, 8. And you can add equal volumes of buffer solution, okay, just to maintain the pH so that it doesn't deviate uh, too much okay, when something happens. Okay, the next one of the uh, third part that you should have in your answers, the constant variable. Have two constant variables in your answers. So first of all, the temperature. Because if you're relating to enzymes, you are, you are changing pH, therefore temperature has to be controlled. You cannot have both variables swinging one, one around in each other because it will definitely deviate. You know that in enzymes, it will deviate both of these factors. So when you are changing pH, temperature has to be controlled. So that's why the first thing that in a CV that we want to expect in this sort of question is temperature. But now is that how are you going to maintain that temperature? So I'm sure you know this equipment, the thermostatic control water bath. Okay, so this is something that I think is a very classic uh, example that you must have. Do not just put water bath, put thermostatic control because you need to maintain this temperature properly because it is enzymes. The next one, the volume or the concentration of the albumin solution has to be the same. So I'm sure this is also another classic example that you need to make sure that while you are changing the pH, you need to make sure that all other variables are kept constant. So this includes the albumin solution. How much you're adding or what's the concentration of it has to remain the same. Okay, it shouldn't change or shouldn't be anywhere different. Okay, now the safety. The safety give a precaution what happens and what you should wear to prevent or protect yourself from that risk. So wear eye protection to prevent chemical splashes. And lastly, this is a repeat, which is a classic thing that you must have to get your one point is to repeat more than two times to ensure accurate results. So I think this is a very simple experiment. It shouldn't be too complicated. You can either write in this form or you can write it in a paragraph form, whichever you like. Okay, but other than this question, it has to be in paragraph form already. 
Okay, part C, describe how to do the emulsion test to show the fat is present in food sample. So this is a very new question. Although I have been waiting for this question to come out because most of the time they ask for Benedict solution. So this time around, they are asking for fat emulsion. So I'm sure that some of you may be quite shocked to see this if you been practicing a lot of Benedict solution, a lot of these uh, the, this other uh, food tests, and now they brought you up to fat emulsion test, then this is something that you should be careful of. So you have to have the fat sample mixed with two centimeter cube of ethanol and shake. You have to shake. This is a very important keyword. Then afterwards, you add ethanol with an equal volume of water. So if you have the same two centimeter cube of ethanol, so add the same volume of two centimeter cube of water. Then positive test will indicate cloudy emulsion. So in order to get your two marks, right, you have to mention first the process of how you're going to achieve this. And secondly is what is the positive test? Because they're asking you to see what kind of indication to show that there's fat present in that solution or that sample. Okay. Okay, question 2a, figure 2.1 is a photograph of a leaf from an oak tree, a Quercus species. Draw a large diagram of the whole oak leaf shown in figure 2.1. So this is roughly how it looks like. It's, a very, it's not a very nice drawing, but it's supposed to be not nice. So make sure that you have all your outlines correct and make sure you have this, uh, this midrib, the stem of the leaf, something like a stem that which has connected veins or branches. Make sure you have a minimum of one. This is one. Then this is two, three, four, five, six, okay, and seven. Okay, about seven of these veins that's popping out from there, and I think you should be okay. Make sure you do not have any uh, double double drawings, okay? Make sure it's just a single line. Don't don't worry, do not use a ruler, just sketch it. Just sketch as how it's gonna look like. Okay, for part two, line PQ on figure 2.1 represents the width of the oak leaf. So measure the length of the line PQ. So roughly, I drew, uh, used the ruler through this iPad, it would be a 43 millimeter. But again, you have to check back on the mark scheme, which will be released later on to see um, what is the actual result. And afterwards, you should conduct this uh, magnification. They have already given you the formula. You just substitute the 1.4 coming from this part and you just divide it, you're gonna get 30.714 and make sure you're in 2SF, which you get 31, so it's 31 millimeter, okay? All right, now part three, figure 2.2 shows photographs of oak leaf and the holly hawk, Elsia rosia leaf. The magnification of both photographs is not the same, okay? They tell you it's, it's gonna be an indication of a comparing question here. So now, table 2.1 gives one visible difference between the two of the leaves and you have to give two other visible difference and do not include reference of size. Don't say that this size is bigger than another, don't, okay? Use specific characteristic features that you can see here and make a comparison. So first thing, what I've mentioned here is that the shape of the leaf is different. So I mentioned that it's uh, for the oak leaf is much of a lobe shape, okay? And it's with several distinct pointed projections because there's a pointed projections here. Okay, that is what I mentioned. And for the hollyhock, it's shaped like a heart, uh, a bit round in, round in nature with wavy edges, indicate these wavy edges here, and along the lower border. So you only can see mostly at this border, okay? And the third one I mentioned is a distinct single vein branch off from the main central midrib. So midrib is this one. Okay, this is the midrib. So there's significant uh, vessels that actually uh, branch out from there. But if you see the hollyhock leaves, there are actually multiple veins that are actually radiating out from this uh, sub branch of the midrib that has come that's come out from it. Okay, so yeah, essentially that's how you see. You don't have. I know that you may not be able to get the same exact explanation, but make sure that when you're describing, just use what you are able to describe okay use your knowledge on like what you can see and what you can actually uh, picture it okay you don't have to be the exact same answer as long it's something different and not what the questions uh i've already told you okay okay part b students investigated the effect of light intensity on the surface area of the leaves of the soybean plant 100 soybean seeds were planted in pots and put into the shade and then another one is put into full sun and after for allowed to germinate and grow for 30 days and you can see three of the older leaves are removed and the three of the younger leaves were removed from each plant and the surface area is measured so state the dependent variable obviously the dependent variable has been mentioned here the surface area of each removed leaves because when they tell you measured that is really the keyword that this will be a indication of a dependent variable 
Now, state to why the students use a large number of soybean plants. So again, I think this is a very common question of like saying that why we have to pick more people and not just a few. Why is to show that there's a larger sample rep representation so that you can reduce the impact of individual variation or out any potential outliers. So you have a larger representat representation in a way. Okay. And part three, the student estimated the surface area of each leaf using graph paper as shown in figure 2.3. Now, you need to see how are you going to use this graph paper to measure the surface area. So, in the past papers, we can see that they, we used to, these questions used to ask us to count the amount of boxes. So now, you have to look in another perspective now to see how are you going to set up this and to count for the surface area. All right. So first, since they already placed the leaves here, the first thing you have to do is to draw the outline of the leaf. When you draw the outline, then you can take it out and you can start counting the boxes. That's the aim. So we trace the outline or edges of the leaf into the graph paper and we count the amount of how the number of full squares first. When you count the number of full squares, then you know a bit of an estimate of how big it is already. Then afterwards you count the or estimate the partial square, whether it is uh, if it's let's say uh, lesser than half, then it's considered as zero or if it's more than half then you consider as one something like that or you can use more accurate like mm, you don't really have to delve too deep but as long as you uh, also consider the full squares and the partial squares and then you add up sum up then that's the surface area already and make sure units is there okay the surface area add up and units of centimeter square okay all right, part C, the results of the investigation are shown in table 2.2 and they've already given you this. This time, they are not asking for a line graph. They are asking you for a bar chart. So it's actually quite tricky at first when I actually can do this question. So I think the hardest part is to determine how your x-axis would look like. Y-axis, I'm sure you know, will be the mean surface area of the leaves, okay, which is actually indicated here. Make sure you have your units to to uh, in bracket form and then for the x-axis what i have suggested is to put different combinations of lighting condition and the leaf edge and i've put the full sun and the shade and in the respective bar chart side by side i put young and old okay this is one way to do so or uh, if you have any suggestions please feel free i will also have a look at see whether i can actually accept your answer or not but roughly this is how the graph would look like okay the bar chart would Mm, roughly you would see okay and for part two the students were calculated that there was a 15.6 percent increase in the size of young leaves when they were grown in full sun now you have to see the percentage increase of surface area that have been uh, old leaves that have been grown in the full sun conditions compared to the old leaves so you use 78 minus 58 over 58 times 100 you get 34.48 and round out to one decimal place you're going to get 34.5 percent you get your values from this table lah. okay this table we actually give you so 78 minus 58 between the difference between full sun and shade you divide by shade and you times by 100 okay for part three state two conclusions from this investigation so what we can see here is that when there's actually light intensity playing into a part then you can see that it will affect the surface area of the of the soybean leaves and we can also see that the older leaves okay you can see the most of the older leaves have much larger surface area so you can see that the older leaves have larger surface area comparing to younger leaves and lastly, the hydrogen carbonate indicator is used to test for the presence of carbon dioxide and the aquatic plant was placed in a red hydrogen carbonate indicator. So if it started here, okay, and it's put under bright light, okay. The plant takes in carbon dioxide as it photosynthesizes. So state the final color of the hydrogen carbonate indicator. So there's two clues to tell you that what will be the color is so bright light it means that there's actually maximum light intensity when it undergoes photosynthesis it will produce oxygen so i'm sure you know that oxygen will be released when you have oxygen released your co2 level uh, levels will drop therefore in your hydrogen carbonate indicator it will be purple in color so you'll be wondering how do i know whether it's purple or red or yellow just remember as pm roy and P being the lower CO2 levels and Y being the higher CO2 levels. Red will be the starting point. Okay, so just remember the three colors, P, R, and Y. That's it. So that's why the answer is purple in color. You can use this as a references image. 
Okay, so that is all for this paper. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment in the comment section below and check out this answer sheet uh, so that you can use it for your reference. And shout out to Hiba Koro for actually um, sending me this paper and I hope this helps all of you. And see you in the next video again. Bye-bye.